Good morning. This is a good day. This is a great day. God's made it, that's why. But it's also a good day because Monday, October 21, is a day I've been looking forward to for a long time for all of you. Today we, we welcome a special gift to campus. Napo, I see you. Don't think I don't see you. You guys think you can hide in the back. Buckle up, guys. This is going to be a big morning. So it is my privilege to introduce to all of you the Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings. Dr. Jennings is Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies at Yale University's Divinity School. He's the author of The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, which won the 2015 Grawemeyer Award in Religion. Dr. Jennings was a professor at Duke University, at Duke Divinity School, and I was a student there. And he was widely respected by everyone as being a, a rigorous theologian with a full heart for Jesus. What Dr. Jennings believes is that discipleship requires community. We need one another to follow Jesus. And it's in our gathering that we become disciples who can tell the truth, and who can love well. I believe he's right. This morning, we will see Jesus better together than we would have if we were on our own. So Dr. Jennings is also this year's Andrews Lecturer in Christian Unity. And here at Greenville University, I get to, I have the privilege of serving as the Andrews Chair. And the Andrews Lecture in Christian Unity is the flagship event of the year. And I bring in the ringers for this talk, and Dr. Jennings is the ringer. So I hope you can make it tonight at 7 p.m. His talk is titled, Being Christian in a World of Possessions. You should also know that Dr. Jennings is a pastor. He's a reverend. And here in a minute, he's going to bring us to Jesus. So buckle up. Would you please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings. Good morning, everyone. It is a joy for me to be here with you. I've been looking forward to coming since Ben sent the invitation. And I'm so glad to see so many of you this morning. Looking at you all reminds me of um, my undergraduate days. I went to a Christian college uh, not too far from here, up north. And I remember having to go to chapel as a requirement. And I remember Monday mornings and thinking to myself, why did I come to this school? <laughs> Why did I come? I know God sent me here, but why? Why? So thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here, especially after having, I understand, a very, very busy homecoming. So it's glad to see you. Even though it's required, it's still, it's still good to say thank you. And so thank you, for, thank you for being here. This morning, I'd like to draw your attention, if I could, to a passage of Scripture from the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And I, I hear the rain as I'm speaking, so that's so wonderful. It's confirmation that God appreciates what I'm about to say, you know, that it's raining. <laughs> well, the Gospel of Mark, the eighth chapter, and if I could just draw your attention to the, those first few verses in the Gospel, in the gospel of, of Mark. In those days, when there was a great crowd without anything to eat. He called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance, Jesus said. His disciples replied, how can one feed these people with Bread here in the desert. Great question. He asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distribute them to the crowd. They had also a few small fish. 
And after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled. They took up the broken pieces left over, seven full baskets. Now there were about 4,000 people. And then he sent them away. This is one of the most famous miracles of Jesus. Even people who know very little about him or the Bible or his ministry, they know about, they know about this miracle. It is known by New Testament scholars as one of the signs of the coming reign of God, what used to be called in older language, the kingdom of God. And at essence, sisters and brothers, these signs indicate what God wants in the world and for the world. In this case, God wants everyone, everyone fed. There are, in this little story, three crucial players. There's Jesus, there's the crowd, and there's the disciples. Jesus, the crowd, and the disciples. The crowd, the crowd is very important in this story and throughout the Gospels because the crowd, how shall I say this? The crowd is us. People from all walks of life, the good and the bad, the proud and the lowly, the rich and the poor, the cute and not so cute. I just want to add that, throw that in there. Revolutionaries and supporters of the status quo, believers and unbelievers, Jews and Gentiles. These are people who normally would never, ever be together. In fact, many of them are serious enemies. I mean, serious enemies. If Jesus wasn't present, they'd probably kill each other. But here they are together, only because they want to hear this prophet Jesus and possibly get some help from him. So in this desert place, that crowd, that motley crew, that crowd grew hungry. Now remember, some of them are enemies. Many of them don't like each other, but they grew hungry and Jesus turned to his disciples and gave that famous command, feed them, feed them. And all the disciples had were a few small fishes and a little bit of bread. And of course we know this looks always like an impossible situation. Here is a hungry and needy crowd and it looks like there isn't enough food to go around. But this is the lie that God wants to destroy. The lie of scarcity. <sighs> There's just not enough to go around. Not enough food, not enough shelter, not enough water, not enough medical care, not enough meaningful work. This is the lie that God wants to destroy. This is the lie that the disciples of Jesus, all the disciples of Jesus are being formed by their lives to challenge. Now Jesus' actions here are paradigmatic. He gave thanks. He gave thanks for what he had. He broke it into little pieces and he gave it to his disciples to distribute. He gave thanks for what he had, broke it into little pieces and gave it to his disciples to distribute. In Jesus, God is doing, let's call it an economic performance. You know, there are a lot of economic theories around, and I'm sure you've been exposed to a few here at school. Some of them are overblown. Some of them are utterly ridiculous. I won't name any right now. If you ask me after this sermon, I'll name a few for you. Some are ridiculous. But this morning, I want you to think less about economic theories and more about this economic performance. 
that God wants to bring about in the world. It is a performance that would shape a world for sharing. A world for sharing. These actions of Jesus show us the structure of a world for sharing. There is the giving of thanks for this world in ways that honor and cherish it. You know, we Christians have not done a good job in performing our thankfulness. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. We gave to the world a sick vision of extraction, extraction, which said in effect that all that exists is for our use and our pleasure. So we can take what we want, make of it what we want, and leave whatever we don't want. We distorted our own sense of thankfulness by turning it into being mostly thankful, mostly thankful for the things we use, the things we get, and the things we exploit. But our sense of thankfulness as Christians should begin with our lives in this world, a world that we have not made but have received by grace. It is a world we share with other creatures. And of course, a lot of people haven't gotten the memo that we share this world with other creatures. Living thankfully for the world we share with other creatures is the beginning of shaping a life not controlled by anxiety or fear or even complaint. Jesus gave thanks and broke it into pieces, broke into pieces what was given to him. He broke what he had into smaller pieces in anticipation of sharing. We, however, my dear friends, are being formed in economic practices and sensibilities that teach us to hoard. You know, we live in and we are a hoarding nation. It's an important thing to be able to say to ourselves, we are a hoarding nation. We use more of the world's resources than any other country. Hoarding happens constantly all around us. Hoarding happens in the absence of a practice of breaking. Jesus' life anticipated the sharing and this is the collective calling of his disciples, all his disciples, to anticipate the sharing. Sharing. Sharing has always been the antidote to greed. Always. It is also the power to turn our con consumptive habits toward the good. At this point in my life, I don't think we can get rid of our consumptive habits. I think they're just in us. But I think we can turn them toward the good. That is, our desire to consume can be joined to a desire that God wants to give us to share. <laughs> we must war against the silence that accepts a world of hoarding and the inequalities that are the engine behind so much misery in this world. Which brings me to the last thing Jesus did. He gave his disciples the task of distributing to all. You know, we Christians have a long history, a long and beautiful history of feeding the hungry and offering assistance to those in need but we have not really understood the radical implications of these actions. We, my friends, we see need. That's, if you don't remember anything else from this morning, I want you to just remember those little words. We see need. Before we see nations or corporations or economies or costs 
or products, we see need. Before we see borders or enemies or threats, we see what is missing, what's marginalized, what's absent, what's damaged, what is and who is being harmed moment by moment, day by day. We see what others ignore. We see what others don't have time to be bothered by. If we Christians, especially in this country, saw need first, maybe we might be able to help people be less obsessed with seeing borders or nations or enemies. Jesus invites us to enter into this holy way of seeing. It is where life together begins by seeing what is needed. God sees what we need. In fact, as you all know, right now, God sees what you need, each of you. This is the, this is the beauty of life with our God. We can speak honestly and earnestly with the God to whom we are never hidden. Isn't that right? God seeks to form us to see need because with that ability to see, God gives the power to act and would guide us to do what others think impossible. So, As I close this morning, I I have a simple prayer for you as you continue in your academic year and in your wonderful career here at this fine institution. That God would form in you maybe something that you don't want. The ability to see need, an ability that would break through at the times you least want it pressing you to see what God is seeing in the world and that you would hear God saying to you, take what you have, give thanks for it, break it into little pieces and give people, the people around you, what they need and I will be with you. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we are so thankful for this beautiful moment in which you've spoken to us early on a Monday when our energy and attention maybe hasn't caught up with our bodies. We ask that when they do catch up with our bodies, remind us of what was said this morning. In fact, Draw what was said said to us this morning, draw it deep into our hearts. Allow it to speak through our souls and in the moments that we least want to remember it, in the moments when our minds are turned toward many other things, in those very moments, speak this word to us. Look, see the need, see the need beyond your fear, beyond your anxiety, beyond your worry, beyond your anger, see the need and give what I have given to you. Speak that word to us. For we are your servants and we wish to hear you always, even when we act like we don't. We are thankful that you've risen from the dead with all power in your hand and that you have placed that power in us. Draw it forth, O God, that we might be the witness this world needs. We pray this in the name who rose from the dead, the name of Jesus. Amen. May I invite you to stand for the benediction? And now may the God who raised Jesus from the dead Speak to your hearts and open your eyes and grant you the great gift to see what others refuse to see. And more importantly, grant you the power to make a difference. Amen.